Income tax 2023-2024. Residential rental property, rental income and expenses if no personal use of the dwelling. We're focused here on the expenses, the rental expenses, part one of rental expenses. Get ready and some coffee because we're providing some inspiration about income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product because... The fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 527, residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're looking at line one income of the income tax formula. Remember in the first half of the income tax, Tax formula is basically a funny income statement having income minus instead of expenses deductions resulting in instead of net income taxable income the schedule E like the schedule C for sole proprietor businesses has basically an income statement format as well basically having rental income minus rental expenses which you could call rental deductions resulting in in essence net rental income which is what ultimately rolls into line one income of our income tax formula this formula outlining the calculation on the form 1040 page one of which we see here this is the income area where the schedule e ultimately rolls into line eight additional income from schedule uh, one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part one additional income schedule e rolling into line five rental real estate and so on and so forth attach the schedule e this is the schedule e supplemental income and loss from rental real estate royalties so on and so forth basically having an income statement format per in essence the property when we're applying it to the rental income all right so we're going to be continuing on with our discussion last time we talked about income situations focusing in on income when we think of the schedule e which is basically an income statement format we're imagining a situation where we have rental property which is separate meaning we're not commingling the property we're not living in the property and renting part of the property we're not talking about a vacation home where we use it partially as a vacation home partially for rent but rather possibly another house exclusively that we are renting and then we'll go into some more of those complex situations where we have both personal and rental use in future presentations we're now focusing in on the expense side of things usually the most or more complex side of things because remember remember that income is fairly straightforward if you rented the property and you're receiving income from it you know that the income is for the business use or the rental use of the property with the expenses we usually have a lot more categories of expenses that we have to basically uh, deal with and we have things like depreciation and we have things that uh, the accrual basis versus the cash basis can come into play in different categories of expenses as well so let's dive into them rental expenses and most cases the expenses of renting your property such as maintenance insurance taxes and interest can be deducted from your rental income so this is normally just the natural thing that you would expect from an income tax system in other words if you have an income tax you're paying for your federal government basically the military and whatnot 
to protect us with an income tax, then you would expect that they wouldn't tax you on gross income, they would tax you on the net income because you would be allowed to take the deductions for those things you needed to expend in order to generate revenue, which is most clear and easy to see on like a Schedule C or a Schedule E. When we look at the Schedule A, for example, or other things deductible for a person that has like a W-2 income, it can get kind of confusing because a lot of the things there are not natural to an income tax kind of thing. Those are things that the government's trying to use to nudge us, manipulate our behavior and whatnot, and have different purposes than you would expect from just a natural kind of income tax system, like paying, uh, getting a deduction for charitable contributions, for example, or deducting your personal property, like interest on your home or your state taxes and stuff. So these are things uh, that they might have a purpose. You can argue for them, but again, they're not the things that you would expect to just be natural to an income tax type of system. The, the, the things that you had to consume to generate revenue, you would think quite natural. Therefore, the Schedule E in that way is fairly nice conceptually to understand. Personal use of rental property. So if sometimes you use your rental property for personal purposes, you must divide your expenses between rental and personal use. Also your rental expenses deductions may be limited. So for bookkeeping purposes, we typically like to keep the business stuff, in this case rental business, separate from the personal stuff so that we can judge how well we're doing in the rental side of things as well as on the personal side of things that becomes difficult to do if we have property used both for business and personal most commonly this happens if you actually own the property and part of that property you are renting and living in it because then you have part of the property for the expenses that you're paying most likely for the entire property that should then be allocated between business and personal or you have a vacation home that you use it partially for business. Now we're gonna, again, focus most of our time this time on situations where we have a unit specifically for rental, and then we'll add the complications of partial use, either a vacation home or you uh, live in it and you rent part of the place you're living in. All right, part interest. If you own a part interest in rental property, you can deduct expenses you paid according to your percent ownership. So obviously, if you have a separate property, you've got this rental property, multiple people own it, then you're gonna have to somehow allocate the income, the net income in essence between you, which might be done with a partnership because now it looks like you have a kind of a partnership situation, in which case you might have a partnership return calculating the total amount of uh, net income, the income statement, basically on the partnership return, which would then flow through to the individual tax returns, the form 1040s for the owners with the use of a K-1. Uh, but you're going to need to, of course, split that out uh, in some way so that you can record the income and expenses that should be allocated to you in a joint ownership situation. Let's look at an example. Roger owns one half undivided interest in a rental house. So last year he paid 968 for necessary repairs on the property. Roger can deduct 484, 50% uh, uh, as a rental expense. He is entitled to reimbursement for the remaining half from uh, the co-owner. So you have a co-owner basically situation in that case. So the expense should be divided between the two of them and the other owner. So he paid for it, right? So the, the tricky thing about this one is you might think, well, he should he's the one that paid for it, but in, in essence, it's a, if it's a co-ownership, then you should be dividing, he should get half of the expense for the rental property, and the other half is owed to him by the other, by the other owner. So, and again, you can get into questions in terms of how you're gonna report this in terms of, should you have two Schedule E's, that you're breaking out the, the allocation of the rental property or so on and so forth, or possibly have like a partnership uh, type of situation with a flow through on uh, the K-1s, but that's the general idea. When to deduct. So you generally deduct your rental expenses in the year you pay them. So that's gonna be generally the case, especially if you're on a cash-based uh, type of system. 
Uh, so remember the two systems we talked about, cash-based system, accrual-based system. Oftentimes people use the cash-based system if they can because it's a little bit easier to track uh, the cash flows. So if you use the accrual method, you can see publication 538 for more information. So types of expenses listed below are the most common rental expenses. Now these aren't the only rental expenses, but noting that the type of industry will often drive the kind of expenses that are commonly needed in order to help generate revenue so we can predict what the normal rental expense categories would be for rental property so they include things like advertising so clearly advertising to get things out there auto and travel expenses which becomes an issue in a similar fashion as we saw with the schedule c because you might have different calculations on how you get to that mileage method or a uh, the actual method cleaning and maintenance uh, commissions depreciation and depreciation becomes a huge issue because now the property itself might need to be having depreciation on it which adjusts the basis of it and so on and so forth uh, insurance interest other legal and other professional fees, local transportation expenses, management fees. So you might have management fees helping you to manage it, or you might be managing yourself, which could have an impact as to whether you're materially participating in the rental property and so on, which could have impacts as to whether it's a business versus a passive uh, income activity, or are you actively participating and whatnot, which we might talk about. Points, which deal with basically interest another form of of interest on a mortgage sometimes gets a little bit complicated with the allocation of points uh, rental payments and the uh, repairs taxes and you know taxes when we talk about taxes uh, for expenses we're usually thinking here not the federal income taxes we're usually thinking like uh, real estate taxes oftentimes as something that might be uh, deductible for federal income tax purposes right and then we've got of course the utilities possibly all right depreciation so depreciation's a big one depreciation being something that we can't really get away from the accrual method for in other words if you have a rental property you see a property you're going to buy it you're going to rent it what if you just pay cash for it can i just deduct the full amount up front well no you can't do that and it seems kind of intuitive that you can't just deduct the the you know million dollars that you paid for the rental property even if you paid cash for it because you're going to get a benefit from that in the future so on a cash-based method you would think you would be able to do that but no you have to do an accrual thing even if you're on a cash-based system putting the property on the books as an asset allocating that cost over the useful life breaking it out between the land and the building only getting an expense or reduction of the basis consuming some of that potential deduction for the amount related to the building because the land is thought not to depreciate in value so we'll dive into depreciation more later depreciation is a capital expense it is the mechanism for recovering your costs in the income producing property and must be taken over the expected life of the property you can begin to depreciate rental property when it is ready and available for rent see placed in service under when does depreciation begin and in chapter two now depreciation note we have a couple issues with the property with depreciation if you buy the property it's pretty straightforward what the cost is and then you have to be breaking out between the building and the land so that we allocate the depreciation we'll talk about that later note you might have a situation where it was personal property and now you're renting it maybe you lived in it and then you moved to a different place and now you're going to be renting that property you have an issue there to try to figure out what the cost or basis is since you didn't just buy it on the market which is difficult with rental property because the property is unique in nature not something you can just look up on like the stock exchange as we could do if it was just like stocks that are being sold or you might have inherited the property or had a gift of the property which again could cause complications in terms of what that initial basis of the property is and remember we always have that relationship between the basis and the depreciation because 
it, it, it's going to impact the sale when we sell the property at, at the end. So we're consuming some of the the potential tax benefit when we depreciate the property that will then come to play when we sell uh, the property in the future, possibly resulting in a gain. We also have the complications of the idea of if it's your personal residence, principal residence, you might get an exclusion, which you wouldn't get if it's rental property. And that whole issue of 1031 exchanges at the point of like selling the property. Okay, so insurance premiums paid in advance. So if you pay an insurance premium for more than one year in advance, you can't deduct the total premium in the year you pay it. So we're imagining typically people are on a cash-based system, but insurance is funny because unlike the utility bill, which you pay after you actually consume the utility with insurance, you typically pay beforehand, which means you prepay the insurance the IRS being skeptical of prepaid expenses because it looks like you can manipulate the deduction, taking the deduction earlier by simply paying the money sooner, and you could just manipulate the cash flow. So they're going to they're going to try to limit that, right? They're going to try to limit your ability to basically prepay, which is most clearly seen on something like insurance, which has a natural system of paying for it before you get the coverage. So uh, for each year of coverage, you can deduct only the part of the premium payment that applies to that year. In other words, yeah, you're on a cash-based system, but with this prepayment thing, we're gonna kind of force you to be it more on an accrual-based system because we don't want people manipulating the system with this prepaid thing, which adds complication to your bookkeeping process because it might be from a bookkeeping standpoint, the easiest thing to do is just pay the premium and then record it as insurance expense. But because they're forcing you to do an accrual thing, you might for that expense do the accrual thing on bookkeeping, paying for it, recording it as, a pre, as an asset, prepaid insurance, and then calculated how much of the insurance expense was consumed with an adjusting entry at the end of the year so that you can be in compliance basically doing kind of like an accrual thing with that particular account being in compliance with the tax code so interest expense you can deduct mortgage interest you pay on your rental property when you refinance a rental property for more than the previous outstanding balance the portion of the interest allocable to the loan proceeds not related to rental use generally can't be deducted as rental expense so with when you have the rental property, remember that if it was your principal residence, most people are aware that they're going to get possibly the ability to deduct the interest on the loan. Most people, when they buy property, having to take out a loan, and then the interest would be deductible, usually on a Schedule A, if it was your principal residence, which is unusual because normally if it was your principal residence, it's not part of your business and therefore shouldn't be something that's deductible naturally under an income tax system. But if you're buying the property to rent it to people, it is a business activity. If you needed to finance the purchase of the home, which typically is the case, you're gonna have to pay interest on the loan and that interest because you needed to that purchasing power to generate revenue, you would expect would be deductible on uh, the Schedule E. The repayment of the principal of the loan is not deductible, right? So if you took out if you took out a loan from a bookkeeping standpoint, what happens? You get the money. You're going to increase cash. The other side is going to go to a liability because you got to pay the bank back. And then what happens? Just like if you're renting an apartment, the rent is what what the expense is with regards to renting money a loan. The rent is the interest. The interest is deductible. When you pay back the principal, that part isn't deductible. You're just reducing the liability, which is a little bit confusing to see in a tax return because we don't have the balance sheet on the tax return. We basically only have the income statement with the Schedule E reporting the income and expenses. That's why we see the interest expense, but not the loan principal premium payments, which we would see from a bookkeeping standpoint on the balance sheet side. 
All right, expenses paid to obtain a mortgage. Certain expenses you pay to obtain a mortgage on your rental property can't be deducted as interest. Those expenses, which include mortgage commissions, abstract fees, recording fees, are capital expenses that are part of the basis of the property. So there's an issue, of course, when we first buy the property, If we that's when we have to get everything set up properly and then it should be pretty easy going forward after that point in time. And when we buy the property, the question is, what needs to be included in the cost of the property? What types of things can we expense at that point in time? So it, you would think it would be pretty straightforward. If you're buying a property for $500,000, that's the cost. You buy the property for that amount and that's it. But because it's a big thing, it goes through escrow and all this kind of stuff happens. So, so then the, the, and there could be, if you look at the closing statement uh, from, the, from the transaction, there's gonna be all these kind of fees and whatnot that are happening at the time of purchase. Now, it would be similar to like if you bought a refrigerator for an ice cream shop. When you buy the refrigerator, it might cost $1,000, but you also had to ship it to your place and install it, which you might think you should expense but really that's part of the installation, that's part of the refrigerator. So the, the IRS is typically saying, and so is generally accepted accounting principles, that you should put that on the books as part of the asset, which is not good for taxes because that means that we have to put it on the books as an asset and then instead of getting the expense now, depreciate it over the useful life. So the similarly with the home, a lot of these expenses that you had to expend in order to purchase the home might be something you need to include in the cost of the home as opposed to expensing it at the point in time that uh, that uh, you're purchasing it. Once you have the stuff on the books properly and you're using the same tax software from year to year, the software should properly calculate the depreciation, which is usually the most difficult thing. And then you just need to deal with the income statement uh, side of things and that's usually fairly easy on the data input side to do all right form 1098 mortgage interest statement so if you paid six hundred dollars or more of mortgage interest on your rental property to any one person you should receive a form 1098 or similar statement showing the interest you paid for the year similarly as to if you had your principal residence, the financial institution that you have the loan with to help you purchase the home is typically required to issue the 1098, not only to you, but to the IRS, which will help determine or show the interest expense that you have. Now, when, when you're actually, for a personal home, you're probably not tracking or possibly not tracking in like a bookkeeping system, like a QuickBooks, for example, the interest expense, although it would be a good idea to do that. And so you're, but because it's the personal residence, you're dependent on the bank to have the 1098 to record it. When you talk about the rental property, however, it is going to typically be recorded with some type of bookkeeping system. You can have it in QuickBooks or something like that recording your rental activities and when you pay the mortgage on the rental property hopefully you're breaking out between the the principal payments and the interest when you make them or have some way to break it out uh, there, there's multiple we have multiple bookkeeping courses on how to do this there's a lot of different ways that you can that you can do it uh, because it might be easier to just record the whole thing as part of the loan repayment and then break it out periodically possibly yourself or the CPA breaking it out as an adjusting entry at the end of the year, tying out the loan payment and the interest to the amortization table, which you could double check to the form 1098. So what I'm pointing out here is that obviously when you do the data input for a, for a Schedule E rental property, you should have an income statement and the income statement will probably have on it the amount of rental interest because the bookkeeping has been done for it. And what we need to be able to double check is that number should tie out to the same number that's on the form 1098. If it doesn't, we have to ask why it wouldn't. If the number is, is more than is on the 1098, you could see that that might be a red flag to the IRS. Uh, so that's, so if you, you and at least one other person other than your spouse if filing a joint return were liable for and paid interest on the mortgage 
and the other person receive the Form 1098, report your share of the interest on Schedule E Form uh, 1098, Line 13. So now we have this issue that the 1098 might go to someone else, and that's going to confuse the IRS, so you don't like to have that be the situation, but that could happen sometimes. Then you want to attach a statement to your return showing the name and address of the other person. So you're going to say, hey, look, I'm deducting mortgage interest. I did not get a 1098 for it like I normally would, but this other person got the 1098. And because of this strange situation we have, it's legitimate for me to be able to deduct it. So go over there and double check the fact that the mortgage interest is legit. So legal and other professional fees. So you can deduct as rental expense, legal and other professional expenses, such as tax return preparation fees uh, you paid to prepare Schedule E. So that seems fairly straightforward if you had to pay accountants, obviously, and uh, possibly lawyers and whatnot, then those are normal uh, legal expenses typically if you paid them in conjunction with the business they were things you had to consume in order to generate revenue ordinary and necessary business expenses for example on your 2023 schedule e you can deduct fees paid in 2023 to prepare part one of your 2022 uh, tax uh, schedule e so in other words the tax preparation itself if you have a schedule c on it you, you the tax preparer could be able to say, okay, how much of the fee that I am charging is for the work done on the Schedule E itself, which that part of the fee should be deductible. Whereas the part of the fee that is for the rest of the return, preparing a Schedule A, for example, uh, isn't deductible because that's a personal expense, not a business expense. So we have this allocation of the accounting fees that needs to take place in that uh, instance. So you can also deduct, uh, that might be easy to do, by the way, because some tax preparers, they, do, they charge people by form. So they might have an allocation of how much they charged you for the Schedule E in particular, but that might not be the case for all people because some tax preparers might do it by just hours or something and whatever. So you can also deduct as rental expense, any, uh, any expenses other than federal taxes and penalties you paid to resolve a tax underpayment related to your rental activities. So obviously dealing with the IRS, if you have to pay a CPA to kind of represent you and deal with that, you can pay, that's deductible. However, the, the fees that they charge are not gonna be typically deductible. So if the IRS charges you a penalty, they're gonna say, hey, we hit you in the face with the stick, metaphorically, of the penalty on purpose. You don't get to deduct it now. We're not gonna let you put some aloe on the wound or anything, we hit you. That's, we hit you for a reason. You're not supposed to do that. So you can't deduct the penalties. So local benefit taxes. So in, the, in most cases, you can't deduct charges for local ben, uh, benefits that increase the value of your property, such as charges for putting in streets, sidewalks, or water and sewer systems. So you might have charges for, for these things, but the idea here is that those things are increasing the value of the property so you're, you're kind of getting a benefit from them because they're increasing the value of the property. So these charges are non-deductible capital expenditures and must be added to the basis of your property. So, so we're not gonna, so whenever we pay for, whenever there's charges, the question comes up in terms of, is it something that should be expensed or is it increasing the value of the property? If it's increasing the value of the property, we might not be able to deduct it, but rather have to put it on the books as, an asset and depreciate it something that we would rather not do because typically we would rather have the expense sooner rather than later put it on the books as an asset and depreciating defers greatly when we're going to get that benefit in the form of deduction of depreciation however you can deduct local benefit taxes that are for maintaining repairing or paying interest charges for the benefits so local transportation expenses so you may be able to deduct your ordinary and necessary local transportation expenses if you incur them to collect rental income or to manage, conserve, or maintain your rental property. So if you're driving on over to the place to pick up your rental payment, you have to knock on the door to get these people to write you a check for crying out loud, then at least you can deduct the 
the amount of gas possibly that it took to go over there or if you're doing work on the property to fix it up because the last person that moved out robbed it and stole the orange tree they dug it right out of the backyard and just wrecked the place it's crazy got to hire better tenants next time then the fees that you have to drive back and forth might be deductible similar situation with the schedule c however uh it's a little bit difficult like with the schedule c in that you can have to determine how you're going to deduct those actual expenses versus the mileage method for example however transportation expenses incurred to travel between your home and rental property generally constitute non-deductible commuting costs unless you use your home as your principal place of business similarly as we can see with a schedule c there's this question of commuting so if you have your own business and you're driving every day say to an office or something like that then that's not usually deductible as expenses because if you mirror that to what a w-2 employee does commuting every day they don't get a deduction for that but if it's your principal residence then then it's not like then you're not commuting to the office your home is the office and therefore if you're driving to a client or something like that from the office you would think that might be a deductible item so you can see more information about that situation with publication 587 business use of your home for information on determining if your home office qualifies as a principal place of business i think we have another course lectures or section on that as well generally if you use your personal car pickup truck or light van for rental activities you can deduct the expenses using one of two methods you've got the actual expenses or the standard mileage rate just like with the schedule c which means that no matter what the bookkeeper does for auto expenses it's you're always going to have to do a tax adjustment at the end because if they use the mileage method then the actual expenses they deduct isn't going to be correct because we're going to calculate the expenses based on the mileage method and if they use the actual expenses it's still not going to be correct because they're probably not adding depreciation because they need the tax software to do the depreciation calculation so for 2023 the standard mileage rate is 65.5 cents a mile for more information you can see chapter four of publication 463 pre-rental expenses you can deduct your ordinary and necessary expenses for managing conserving or maintaining rental property from the time you make it available for rent rental of equipment you can deduct the rent you pay for equipment that you use for rental purposes so in other words if you had to hire or rent things like a jackhammer to dig up the parking lot or something and then fix it or the driveway or whatever you would expect that you'd be able to deduct that as an ordinary and necessary rental expense because you needed to do that in order to fix the driveway so that you can rent the place however in some cases lease contracts are actually purchase contracts so if so you can't deduct these payments you can recover the cost of purchase equipment through uh, depreciation so in other words if you bought the jackhammer and you rented it but actually the rental agreement is like a purchase because you're gonna you have a, a option to buy or something at the end of the rental agreement then even though it's structured as a rent in actuality it's a purchase and therefore you can't expense the rental payments but rather treat it as though you're paying for it and financing it putting it on the books as an asset and depreciating it rental of property you can you can deduct the rent you pay for property uh, that you use for rental purposes if you buy a leasehold for rental purposes you can deduct an equal part of the cost each year over the term of the lease travel expenses you can deduct the ordinary and necessary expenses of traveling away from home if the primary purpose of the trip is to collect a rental income or to manage conserve or maintain your rental property so we talked about uh normal use of the car around your area and around your office travel usually means longer distances often defined as basically you had to spend an overnight trip away from home and therefore it's going to be in the category of travel but the same kind of concept applies in that 
you would you would think if it was ordinary and necessary for the business might be deductible. You must properly allocate your expenses between rental and non-rental activities. One of the problems with travel is when people travel, they like to commingle their business and personal stuff. So, so now you have a question of if you traveled, how much of the travel is allocated to the business versus the personal so that, that you can uh, break that out and deduct the business part or rental business part. So you, can, you can't deduct the cost of traveling away from home if the primary purpose of the trip is to improve. Uh, you can't deduct the cost of traveling away from home if the primary purpose of the trip is to improve the property. The cost of improvements uh, is recovered by taking depreciation. So obviously, if the trip was personal, then it's not really deductible. If the trip was business related, and it's part of an expense, you can deduct it if the trip was necessary for you to to improve the property, you're, you're increasing the value of the property or something like that, then you might not be able to expense it, but rather have to put it in the books as part of the cost of the improvement, and then get the benefit through depreciation. You're, for more information on travel expenses, you can see, see chapter one of publication 463. Uncollected rent. If you are a cash basis taxpayer, don't deduct uncollected rent because you haven't included it in your income. It's not deductible. So what happens if we have, this is kind of like a bad debt type of situation. So what if they don't pay you is the, is the general idea, right? So if they don't pay you, if you're on a cash based system, you never would have recorded the income. So let's say they lived in the property and they owed you the money, but they didn't pay you. On a cash based system, it would just be, we, we, we never would have recorded it in income. So we don't have to write off like the bad debt. Now in actuality, uh, even, even though we kind of think of a cash-based system as the easiest thing to do for the revenue collection, you might use an accrual-based system because, of course, you want to track the people who haven't paid you. So if you were on an accrual-based system, you would invoice them, right? Or you would enter equivalent to an invoice, and that would be recording income at the point in time they owe you the money because they lived in the apartment building or whatever, the complex, the home, and they haven't yet paid you. And then when they pay you, you reduce the accounts receivable uh, uh, and record the cash at that point in time. So, so what if they don't pay you? Well, if you're never going to get paid, then if you are on a cash-based system, you never would have recorded the income. But if you are on an accrual-based system, you would have recorded the income when they owed you the money after they lived in it. And if they're not going to pay you, then you got to deal with like a deduction for that possibly. So if you use the accrual method report income when you earn it. So if you are unable to collect the rent, you may be able to deduct it as a business bad debt. So again, if you recorded it in income and then they didn't pay you and they're not gonna pay you, then you might be able to record it as an expense, a, a bad debt expense because the income was overstated and therefore you're in essence negating it with the bad debt expense. All right, see section uh, 166 and its regulations for more information about business bad debt.